across Canada uh, and down into Mexico, uh, there's a revival going on amongst the uh, old colony Mennonites, the low German speaking. There, there is something happening there that is pure. The word, it's God working. And so, you know, the Lord has brought about 40,000 immigrants from Mexico and South Central America to Ontario uh, over the last number of years. That's the figures according to Mission, uh, Mennonite Central Committee. Many of them are seeking the Lord and coming to faith in an incredible way. Uh, and we've been blessed here. To, uh, the Lord has brought, brought quite a number to us at Wallenstein. And, and we said, Lord, thank you. Thank you for doing it. That's his work. It's not our work. Um, but there's a literacy challenge uh, because many of them struggle with English. And they may be able to talk, you know, in the marketplace or for work or whatever, but actually get out and study the Word of God. Uh, there's a real struggle. We found that. And so we've been, we've tried using Christianity Explored, uh, but English is a barrier. I, I'll just show you just a, a very short section from Christianity Explored. What we've tried using... Um, but it's a bit of a struggle. We got sound there? So this is how it starts. And this is starting on Tuesday night, by the way, here. What's the most beautiful sight you've ever seen? For me, it was probably Table Mountain in South Africa. I was visiting my twin sister and some friends and I... See, you know, see the problem there? If you speak English as the first language, you've got to get over his British accent. <laughs> uh, but it's a struggle. So what's been happening? Well... The uh, Lord has done something really incredible for us. He's opened uh, quite a door for us here. Um, the, the special projects coordinator in England, get this, is a Mennonite from British Columbia. So we reached out to Christianity Explored and asked them if we could take this material and turn it into Low German. And it took them a day to get back to us. <laughs> Lady said, yeah, I'm a Mennonite. This is amazing. Uh, who would I, we've, we've been given access to a professional studio, Reach Beyond, that's in Cambridge, right here, that does this kind of work. Okay? And what would cost literally tens of thousands of dollars is costing us nothing. <laughs> they do their ministry by faith. We need to pray for these people. And, uh, you'll hear more about that as it goes along. But when we went down to see them, expecting what would be tens of thousands of dollars to try to raise for this, and they said, no, we do this by faith. And so there's a team of people that are meeting every week. You can see a group of them there sitting around the TV. You won't, you'll only recognize one of them there, John Weeb, but um, that's somebody's grandpa that's in here, right? You see your grandpa there? That happens to be Susan Edrillon's father on the left-hand side there. Uh, Martin Reimer and John Giesbrecht, he's there in front of the machine. So every week, actually every Saturday and every Wednesday, these people are volunteering their time and going down and working on translating, taking this, and turning it into uh, video. And so what's really amazing is we're taking 10 of these videos, and this is what's being done with them. Here's the same video now. It still needs a little more work. We're not quite done yet. But notice the difference. Ora ist der Grundschmackste, wo die jemals hier sein hast. Für mich ist das vielleicht der Dashboy in Südafrika. Ich werde meine Sester besitzen und ich gehe nach dem Freund, fahre nach dem Boy nach und mir denke, dass die Seine, wo die Sonne auf dem Stortag, wo die 3000 Schollehe ist. Und dort ist auch so schmack, dass wir vergessen von unserer Vertal und stünden du ganz stark. Was würde das für dich? Who here understands that? What do you think? It's pretty good, isn't it? Right? 
Okay, we've got a long way to go yet. We're barely through video one. There's ten of them. But God is amazing. I, I, really, right? But you know what? It doesn't stop there. <laughs> if that wasn't enough, did you know there were 85,000 old colony in Canada? And there happened to be about 220,000 in Mexico, Central, and South America. So all of these videos, this is already being worked out and organized right now, they're going to be uploaded and given free to a network of churches and missionaries across North, Central, and South America. So we're dialoguing with EMMC, which happens to be the Evangelical Missionary, uh, Mennonite Missionary Church out in Manitoba, and they're going to help us working with translating the workbooks and everything else. And so <laughs> it's going to be used to have the potential for reaching 300,000 not just the people in our corner. So we have a lot to be praised and in awe of. And this really is a great caveat into our message this morning because we need the presence, the power, and the protection of the Holy Spirit for this. Does that make sense? Right. So we're going into continuing our series here, You're Not Alone. And just as we go into this, and this is what we're going to be thinking about this morning, right? Studies on the Holy Spirit. What does this even mean? What does this look like to have the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit working with us and working in our lives? What does it look like? We, we throw this around all the time, but what does it actually look like to be filled with the Holy Spirit and be being used by Him in a powerful way? What should it look like? You know, that's the, we, we throw that around, but has anybody got the answer for that one? Can anybody give me a crystal clear? You know, we've, we've got our ideas. You know, it's kind of like, uh, and I'm a Star Trek fan, so, you know, this lets out my age, though, because this is the original Star Trek series. Anybody here have, see the original Star Trek series? Uh, don't be ashamed. Come on, you gotta put your hand up, right? Okay. Well, there was a, a, a one called The Cage, Many, many, this is, this is going back a long ways. And it was a very fascinating, uh, it, actually a lot of them were because they, were, they weren't just designed, they weren't just people making movies, they were making political statements, they were making statements about philosophical statements about life. But there was this one, this one that was called The Cage, and they happened to come to this planet and they find this beautiful woman from another, uh, um, uh, what do you, spaceship, that had crashed. There were a few of them that had crashed there. And then they ran into these aliens with these big heads who could control people. And for some reason, they wouldn't let these people that had crashed there leave. And the way, what, what it ended up being was, is the woman didn't look like that. She actually looked like that. And these aliens, I mean, you know, this is all fantasy, right? But what was interesting was, is, they had crashed on this planet and the people were severely damaged and mangled and they didn't know what a human looked like. And so they put them back together, but their bodies were all disconnected and, and just a mess. And so they couldn't leave because if they left, that's what they'd look like. Well, it's kind of like the dilemma that we have like, I want to I wanna be filled with the Spirit. I want to be what the Lord wants me to be. Right? He's, he, I'm forgiven all by the work of Christ. He want, he's working in my life. He's not, it's not just I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. That's it. He wants to transform me into the image of Christ. But what does that really look like? You know, I'm, I, we, we're all, we have this problem, right? Because we've never seen in humanly speaking, what it should look like. We got our ideas. But what, what should it be? So here's a quote that we gave to the, all the speakers in the, spirit, uh, in the series, this Holy Spirit uh, series that are speaking. So all of the speakers that are coming here, they get a letter, they get a chart with the passages and whatnot. And we don't tell them exactly what to say, but we give some direction there for the theme. And so here's one of the things that we said to the speakers. We have just completed our preaching series on the book of Romans on the Labor Day weekend. It was a very exciting and encouraging series. We found ourselves challenged by wondering, Lord, how can we live, ever live out this glorious gospel? 
How can we ever live out what God is doing right now in the old colony? You only think of the potential of this area. How can we do that? Right? And the answer is, of course, is that what we said, only by the power of the Holy Spirit who is living inside of every believer. Right? But what does that look like? What does only by the power of the Holy Spirit who is living inside every believer look like? I struggle. So humanly speaking, we really don't know in, in the natural sense. We have to look to the model. And who's the model? Help me with this one. Who's the model? Jesus Christ. Exactly. It's not, our, it's not about, and let me be really clear, okay, in the short time that we have here this morning, this is not about um, making ourselves like Him. That's not where I'm going this morning. It's just what I can pray about and what is my aim? Does that make sense? So I can't look at it. And so I'm not going to present. We're going to look at a passage this morning. The passage that was there. If you read ahead, wonderful. And Luke, if you want to turn there to Luke chapter 3. We're going to start there in Luke chapter 4. But this is not about, okay, here's Jesus and I'm going to make myself like him. But this is, what is the aim? What is the goal? What do I pray for? How do, when I look at my life and say, Lord, how am I doing then I look at him and I see where I'm short and I say, God, <laughs> you've got a long way to go in me. And well, that's okay. Okay? Luke, chapter 3, verse 21, and then into chapter 4, 1 to 21. And so that's why we've called our message this morning, Christ the Model. Because as we're moving into this series, it begins, we've, we've looked in the Old Testament promises of what was to come, but now we see Jesus, we see Him on the earth, and He is all that we could be, should be. Can't make ourselves into Him. He's the model for us. I want to know what it should look like. He lays it out for us. So we're going to start in Luke chapter 3, verse 21. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And he was praying. As he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I'm well pleased. Now we're going to go down to chapter 4. We're going to pass over his genealogy. Chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will be yours. And Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, then throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you uh, carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, and as was his custom, he, took up, so he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and unrolling it, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, he sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
And then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Three things here. The Holy Spirit brings power, and we see this in Christ. We'll see this as the model for life. And I put it in bracket marks because I'm not talking about physical life, but fellowship with the triune God. The Spirit of God brings power for victory, and the Spirit of God brings power for service. Now, bottom line, what, are we gonna, what am I going to say this morning? If Christ needed this, and He's God in the flesh, how much more do I? Does that make sense? It's not really deep at all, but just so practical. Power for life. I mean, why is Jesus baptized? That, that's, a, that's another message for another time, right? Within this passage, there's so much. But it's, okay, what is so clear? Jesus himself said, John 8, 46, which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak the truth, why don't you believe me? There is no sin in Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.21, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. So Christ, who was perfect, who was sinless, God made Him to be sin so that we could, be, we could have His righteousness, the great exchange that happened. So why is Jesus getting baptized? What's going on here? Okay. So just, just briefly, it's, it, what is He showing here? Perfect submission to the Father. Hey, there's some people that you would rather not be associated with. Can you think any of those people right now? Hopefully it's not the person sitting beside you. Hey? <laughs> but there are some people that we would rather not anyone thinks we are their friends. Well, humanly speaking, why would Jesus line himself up with us? But perfect submission to the Father. He did what the Father wanted him to do. He is the model, and I've got that underlined on purpose, right? Because there's no suggestion here he had no need to seek forgiveness of sin, but he modeled it for us because that's what's happening at baptism. He's the Father, wants him to do this, to fulfill all righteousness, as as it says in another passage, right, about about his baptism. But he's the model of what it means to come and seek for forgiveness of sin, So he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, Titus 3.5. So Christ is modeling what needs to happen in every human being. That's submitting to the Father and seeking forgiveness for sin. He's the model of repentance and death to self. That's what's happening in baptism. Again, model underlined because he didn't need to do this He is fully submitted to the Father. He doesn't need to die to it. Well, in in a way, he did die to himself. Right? He he did not seek his own. It's not my will, but your will be done. But but nowhere near what it is for us as we who are sinners, because he is sinless. Okay? He's here is where he is filled with the Holy Spirit. Here is where we see this proclamation, the, the Trinity, where the Father is there. And here is the Son, and the Holy Spirit comes and fills him and anoints him. And behold, my Son, in whom I'm well pleased with that, that beautiful connecting that happened there. I mean, how do I understand all this? I mean, Jesus is God. <laughs> you know, the Holy Spirit is God. God the Father is God. And yet, here he is as a man filled. It, this is just how God chose to do it. This is life. This is power for life. John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Coming to know God the Father through Jesus Christ, being the Holy Spirit coming into you when you repent of your sins. That's life. That's connecting to the living God in a way that's not possible, humanly speaking, on our own. So the question for us is, why would I hold back from this? Am I better than Christ? Some of you haven't been baptized yet. The question is, why not? Why wouldn't you? Christ did. 
He did all of these things. He's the, he's the perfect model for us. He didn't have to do it, but he modeled it for us. But if I want to think about moving forward in my life, and Lord, I need the filling of your Holy Spirit. I need the power of your Holy Spirit in my life because I cannot do this on my own. It begins here for me over and over and over again, week in and week out and day in and day out. Lord, I need to submit to you. I need your power. I need your life. I need communion with you because without it, I have nothing. Does that make sense? He's the model. I can't make myself like this, but I can submit myself to him. Power for victory. The second thing that we saw there. Okay? Jesus, as it said there in, Ju- in Luke 4, you'll notice that because that, that's why we started with the baptism and then came to this. And there's lots more we could say about the baptism. But w- w- what do we see? Well, um, coming in, in, in here to his temptation, he's filled with the Holy Spirit at the baptism. There's the genealogy. We passed over that. And then immediately what happens after that? Full of the Holy Spirit, he returns from the Jordan. He's led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. Now we're only going to scratch the surface of this passage as well. But he's filled with the Spirit, and he's led by the Spirit. That's what's so clear in this passage. He's in the power of the Spirit, and he uses the Word of God in order to resist the devil. In the power of the Spirit, he corrects the misuse of the Word of God. Because you notice there, the devil uses the Word of God. He misquotes it. Jesus has to correct it. But his power, his strength, comes because of the power of the Holy Spirit that's in him. There's no, it's not a mistake that the baptism and the filling of the Holy Spirit took place before Jesus was tempted by the enemy. What does he show in this temptation? Complete dependence on God for his physical needs. Yeah, I can turn bread into stone. As a matter of fact, he could take the stone and turn it into the best hamburger there was around. He could have done what he wanted. Complete submission to God for fulfillment of who he should be. If you are the son of God, I don't need to prove anything. But here, filled with the Holy Spirit. It's just unmistakable. It's clear. It's the Spirit leading him, and he's full of the Holy Spirit. He says, I really don't need what you want to make me into. Thank you very much. God will do what he wants to do. Complete trust in God to fulfill what he said that he would do in him. Full of the Holy Spirit. See, I don't even need the devil to mess me up. I do quite well on my own. Anybody else here? All right. I, I do very well on my own. But what chance do I stand against the enemy without the Spirit? What chance do I stand? What chance do I stand without the Spirit, without a Spirit-led insight into His Word? And yet, i, I got to ask myself as I, I go throughout life and, and start each day, How do I start each day? Is it crying out to him? Lord, guide me. Lord, fill me. Lord, lead me. Or I just start up with what's new today. You know, first check the weather, see what I need to wear, and then look on Facebook, and then check the news. Anybody else do that? Uh, Anybody else? Or is it just me? (laughs) But does it begin here? And does it begin with that quiet contemplation before him and and saying, Lord, Jesus Jesus needed this power. This is what he modeled. Don't I too? Okay. The third one is power for service. You see it again comes out. Verses 14 to 15. So the Spirit of God just comes out so powerfully there. He's, he's filled with the Holy Spirit of baptism. He's filled and full of the Holy Spirit facing the temptation. And then, no mistaking here again, clearly lays out, and Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit and news about him spread through all the surrounding district and he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And you know, it's so easy for us, We just because I do this, mental gymnastics in my head. Well, this was Jesus. He did this because this is Jesus. This is God in the flesh. Absolutely, yes it is. <laughs> 
But if he needed the power of the Holy Spirit to minister and serve, do we? Right? Of course we do. And so the scripture, it's great. And he lays out, go, go and read Isaiah, where he's quoting from. Opens up this big scroll and reads from Isaiah. And the Spirit of God, you notice it's the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel, proclaim release, set free the oppressed, and proclaim God's favor. But it was the Spirit of God who gave him the power to serve. How many decisions do I make? How many decisions do you make? How many things do we do that we just get frantic about them and we forget that He's the one who empowers. He's the one who leads. He's the one who guides. If anybody thinks that we were really smart in order to be involved in all that God is doing in the old colony communi uh, community, well, just forget about that because we didn't have a clue what we were doing. God's done it. <laughs> His spirit is moving. And I mean that. I'm not denigrating anyone or anything. It's like, God, you, you, we can look back and see all these things that have happened where God has led him because of things that happened back then. It's opening doors now. But that's because God orchestrated it and God led it. We desperately need him for power to serve him. Here is Christ. The spirit of God is upon me to do these things. So here I look, I say, he's the perfect man. There's no sin, no insecurity in him, no weakness, no shortcomings, yet he serves filled and called by the Holy Spirit. If he needed the power, what about you and what about me? You've seen this old turkey floating around here sometimes, right? I think I've told you this before, but it's a great opportunity to mention this. I ran into a problem with this thing, and uh, it would die on me. I was the laughing stock of Linwood. I don't know how many people, every, oh, there goes Ron again, and he's got a truck pulling his car. <laughs> I've, I had this big rope. Did I ever tell you this? I had this great big honking rope in the back of my trunk, and I carried that around with me because it would die, and then I'd have to go home. I'd walk home, get my other car, wrap the big rope around the frame, and yank it home again. Well, finally, after a couple of years, we figured out what it was. And there was a little gas line in the back that was kind of bent and twisted and crooked. And there was junk in the gas tank that would stir up when you got driving, and it would go up and hit that kink and then stop all the gas from flowing through, and it would die. It took a long time to figure that out because by the time I towed it home, it would start again, right? Because the gas, the, the, the junk had fallen back into the tank. Well, what's the point, right? Well, it just needed to be straightened up and cleaned out. And then it works. And now I'll go anywhere because it just purrs like a kitten. And I can leave it all winter, pull the battery out, put a little stuff in the tank, and I go out in the spring, drop the battery in, pull the choke back, pump the gas a couple of times, and boom, away it goes. I wish I started that easy. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay. But why? Because it's been straightened up and cleaned out. Well, what about us? Isn't that what the, isn't that what the Holy Spirit does? It doesn't make us fit for heaven. You know, right? It's, it's just... But he, he needs to work in our lives. We desperately need him to work in his lives. So here's this, this desperate question. We're asking this with each of our messages. Are we desperate to be like Christ and live each day reliant on the Holy Spirit? That's the take-home question for us. Not that complicated. Lord, am I desperate for you to be in my life so that I can have real life, fellowship with you. Lord, am I looking to your Holy Spirit to help me to overcome the sins that beset me? Lord, is it about me? Or am I really desperate for your power in my life so I can serve you faithfully? Because you go back to what I shared with you about what God's doing in the old colony community. The enemy will shut us down in a hurry. And if he doesn't, we'll figure out a way to mess it all up. We're good at that. Not just at Wallenstein, I'm talking just humanly speaking. 
We need Him. We need Him for His life, His victory, His power for service, so that His name may be glorified. Let's worship, and then I'll come back and close us when we're finished.